Well, hello there, my beloved Sacred USQ listeners. I am so, so excited for today's guest, and you are going to want to carve out some time. You may want to get your notebook, just find a place, get your tea, get cozy, and get ready for a very, very empowering and amazing interview. I've been so excited about this uh, for quite a while. So let me tell you about our amazing guest today. At the age of 14, Don Miguel Jr. apprenticed to his father, Don Miguel Sr., and his grandmother, Madre Sarita. From that early age, he was called upon to translate Madre Sarita's prayers, lectures, and workshops from Spanish into English. In this way, through constant repetition and review, he learned the content of her teachings in both languages. Through interpreting from Madre Sarita, Don Miguel Jr. came to understand the power of faith. He saw firsthand how she manifested her intent to heal people, both physically and spiritually. Don Miguel Jr.'s apprenticeship lasted 10 years. When he reached his mid-20s, his father intensified his training. At the apex of his power journey, Don Miguel said to his eldest son, find your way out, go home, and master death by becoming alive. For the past 13 years, Don Miguel Jr. has applied the lessons learned from his father and grandmother to define and enjoy his own personal freedom while achieving peace with all of creation. Today, he is married and has two young children. As a Nagual, he continues to pass along the wisdom and the tools of his family's traditions in helping others to achieve their own personal freedom and optimal physical and spiritual health in his lectures and workshops. Miguel Jr. has taken the lessons of his father and grandmother and discovered his own personal path to freedom. Being able to apply his teachings to the world around him gave Miguel Jr. a new understanding of the lessons his father and grandmother have passed on to him, once again giving him the desire to pass on this awareness through his books. He is the author of the books, The Five Levels of Attachment, Living a Life of Awareness, The Mastery of Self, and the Don Miguel Ruiz's little book of wisdom. He also co-authored the book, The Seven Secrets to Healthy, Happy Relationships with his dear friend, Heather Ash Amara. He now helps others discuss op- discover optimal physical and spiritual health through his books so that he may and they may achieve their own personal freedom. Oh my gosh, it is such an honor. Don Miguel Ruiz Jr., Thank you for being here today. What an honor to have you. And I want to tell everyone, this is like amidst the home huddle. We're all cocooned at home. So forgive both of us if you hear either of our children or dogs or whatever come up. We just, we're going to go with the flow. And I'm just honored that we could do this today. Welcome. Hi, Julia. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. Thank you so much for the opportunity. And yes, Full disclosure, my kids are at home and they make, may make noise and so are our dogs. If the doorbell rings, they'll start barking. It's, right. it's, it's, a good, it's a good life. It's a good, I was just going to say, I don't even know if we should apologize. I feel like this is, this is actually one of the gifts is, is having, you know, family to be near. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. So it's, 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 you can almost say it's the, the nice uh, silver lining on the, this whole situation that we're all living through. It's like I get to spend time with yeah. my family, my wife and I, you know, this is the most we spent together like this in a long time, you know, because we both work and uh, the kids are at school. So this is like the past month and a half or so, a little less, to whatever, however many weeks it's been around. We, we've gotten to know each other more. We've gotten to engage each other more. And even though uh, we, I live in Reno, so we've, like for us, we've already got used to cabin fever through winter, you know, the snow and all that. So the nice thing is that I don't have to shovel any snow yeah. at, at the moment. Right. That's a nice, huge plus. But, you know, for us, it's just a nice time to engage each other, play games whenever we can. And yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's nice to be with my wife as much as I have. So that's the nice mm-hmm. side. My deepest condolences to anyone who's ever lost mm-hmm. someone during this time. So my condolences to you mm-hmm. and your family. Yeah, lovely that you said that. I know it's such an interesting, um, such an interesting time where you know it, there's such a collective, I think, grief and fear, and yet the flip side is this this time and space that we have mm-hmm. to be, you know, to go deeper within, to be with family, to cocoon. To it's it's such a juxtaposition. It's really fascinating, actually. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's it's a uh, it's our turn. You know, I've been saying this couple couple of weeks now. It's like 
you know, I, I, when people talk to me about parenting and then they say to me that if parents today have it the toughest they've ever had it. And, you know, because of social media, internet, that kind of thing, and I always answer them, well, no, actually, it's the toughest because it's our turn. You know, think about mm-hmm. our parents raising us in this. And uh, for me, in my case, the 70s and 80s and early 90s, my grandmother raising my father and my mother, you know, my, my grandmas, raising them in the early in the 50s and the 60s and the social uh, change that happened during those decades. Imagine my great grandfather who raised my grandmother uh, during the Mexican Revolution. You know, imagine living in a place where there's war in such a way, and he had to hide my grandmother because. Uh, a, a military uh, unit would come into town and he had to hide them because they would steal and kidnap the, the women. You know, imagine that kind of fear. Mm-hmm. And then her, her, his, my grandma's gra- grandfather had to raise her father during the, to the, during the dictatorship in Mexico. And then my great-great-grandfather, Don Ezequiel was born in 1830s mm-hmm. and he was the first Mexican in the family because mm-hmm. his parents, whose name I don't know, were born during the New Spain, so they weren't considered Spanish. They, no, sorry, they don't. They weren't considered Mexican. They were considered uh, subjects to the king. You know, the whole concept of nationalism didn't exist at the time. So each, just within my family, mm-hmm. each generation has it different. And it's the, if everyone will say it's tough to do it in my time because of all this and this and that. But in reality, it's tough because it's our turn to experience it. And with this whole coronavirus thing and things like that even though we live in a first world country, yeah. nature will win, you know, nature will always win. And it just happens to be our turn to go through an experience such as this. Mm. So our, our uh, hundred years ago, the families went through the Spanish influenza, 200 years ago through the, the black bubonic plague. Uh, they lived a uh, hundred years ago, mm. there was 1.9 billion people in the world and they went through World War I, they went through Spanish influence and after the Spanish influence came the Roaring Twenties and then came the, the Great Depression and our ancestors made it through that and mm. it's, it's our turn. So what yeah. are we going to do? So it, it reminds me of what uh, Jake uh, Tolkien wrote in, in the, in the uh, Fellowship of the Rings or the Lord of the Rings yeah. where Frodo tells Gandalf, I wish we weren't living in such times. And Gandalf replies to him, so do I. And so do all who are living in such times, but that is not for them to choose. What it is our choice is what are we going to do with this time? Yeah. Are we going to let fear dictate us or are we going to stand up and do something about it? We, are we going to engage one another? And that's mm-hmm. the beautiful thing. What are we going to do in this stage mm-hmm. to help one another? And it's our turn to do that. Mm-hmm. I want to come back to that. Um, that's really a beautiful question that you um, that you posed. I want to come back to that. Though, what are we going to do? Before we get into that, if if it's okay, I, I mm-hmm. just am so curious to know more about some of the gifts of being around. I'm not sure if I'm saying it right, but your your grandmother was Madre Sarita. Is that how you say yep, it? You said it right, Madre Sarita. Madre Sarita, and it's just the accent that's so different. Yeah. <laughs> I just don't have the accent you have, but that's all right. I'm trying. Yeah, it's, it's the, the, the name was correct. Okay. Well, just her book of prayers and how you, mm-hmm. I, you know, I know she was a healer. She helped heal people. What, what did you, what was that like growing up around her? What did you learn from her? How do you feel that's still with you? Like, I'm very curious because what a well, gift. Yeah. Uh, well, for me, it was natural. It was normal. I, the spiritual head of this family is still my grandmother, even though she passed away. 12 years ago, she is still the spearhead of the family. My grandma Sarita lived to be 98 years old. Mm. She had 13 children and I have 64 cousins. And I don't know the number of the next generation. It's, it's, it's pretty large. Wow. But uh, growing up around my family, because I live with my grandma Sarita. I live in the same house. I, I, I grew up in National City in, in Chula Vista in San Diego, California. And I went to school in Tijuana. So growing up, uh, my grandmother was giving faith healings. She was uh, she had us, oh, her own little temple in Barrio Logan in San Diego, where she did her faith healings. And on Thursdays and Sundays, she would give her sermons, what she called cathedras, where she would share the tradition with all everyone in the community, which was beautiful. So when I was born in the 1970s, that was already happening. You know, my going to see my grandmother give a, a sermon was a natural thing, kind of like 
someone who grew up with a father or was a preacher man or a, a, a mother who is a, a, also reverend. You know, we, we, we go because we love them and we want to listen to what we said, mostly because we love them, you know. So for me, yes, we, I rebelled against the tradition in my own unique way. I engage that, but my family always had to deal with juxtapositions and dualities. You know, for example, my father uh, was a, a medical surgeon, a, a neurosurgeon. My uncle's a neurosurgeon. My other uncle is an oncologist. My mom is a dentist. My aunt is a psychiatrist. There's Western medicine on that generation. My grandmother and my grandfather were faith healers. They're mm -hmm. both healing in their own unique way, but there's that contrast of different worlds. And my, my uncles would send patients over to my grandma and my grandma would send patients over to them. It was this kind of thing that they just, the whole point was to heal. Yeah. So I grew up with that. There wasn't no division. We saw both uh, traditions as this beautiful knowledge that was exposed to us that we could, instruments that we can use to heal each, each other. So, you know, the, the juxtaposition of growing up in a very academic family with a very spiritual, very spiritual family and living in San Diego, in Chula Vista and taking the trolley to Tijuana and going to school in Tijuana. You know, I, the accent I have comes because I, was, I lived in, in San Diego. I was educated in Tijuana and the accent I have comes because I don't have a, an accent from Tijuana when I speak Spanish and I don't have an accent of San Diego when I live in San Diego, it's, it's kind of mesh. Sometimes people don't realize, they actually don't think I'm Mexican when they start hearing me speak. <laughs> and in that accent, you can hear the, what my grandmother created, you know, because the lesson that she taught us was a faith. Yeah. The complete 100% believe in, in yourself and in your communion with life. You know, mm -hmm. she often mm -hmm. say, it's not me who's doing this work. I'm just a channel by which God creates this. This is, she had a very strong faith and she did a lot of healings. You know, she was in news reports and she gave lectures at UCSD in front of doctors, panelists, and she shared with everyone who wanted to learn how to do faith healings. You know, the only thing she, she didn't do was she didn't give um, uh, diagnosis. She, she didn't diagnose people. She just took care of their symptoms or so, so that point of view. So, from that point of view, and I lived in the same house as my grandma, it was this constant watching her go into meditation, mm. seeing her do her prayers, completely give herself 100%. And she was already in her uh, 80s and 90s you know, the, during this time that I'm speaking about. And even someone with that frail, uh, frail body, she was just bigger than life you know she was just barely five foot in height and uh, in her mm -hmm. 80s and 90s and just pure pure power you know she was just this young little woman young girl in a woman's body but with a wisdom of of a sage you know it's it's you know she was always playful she was always making fun she was always joking she was always just, you know, like she liked to be the instigator of little things. She just liked to do that kind of thing. But at the same time, in a, like that, her eyes would turn serious. And especially, you know, since I lived in the same house with her, you know, sometimes she would give me that stern look. I'm like, mm, you know, like, and she didn't have to say anything. I just like fell in line right away. I'm like, I'm going to kind of I'm, uh, anger my grandmother in that way. But at the same time, uh, the, the level of responsibility that I learned because I was taking care of my grandmother. I, it, it was my in my, 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 in my point of view, it was my desire to take, help her and take care of her that I, as, all she had to do was just say Miguel and I stood up and I went, you know, it's like my grandmother needs me. That's love. Mm -hmm. So w that's exactly what I learned, you know, because all, every weekend the house was be, would be packed with family. You know, it would mm -hmm. be from Thursday to Sunday night just like the people would just come in, like she would have the pot of beans and rice always at the ready, you know, all food always at the ready because you never know when someone's going to show up. And that was nice. That was magical. That was beautiful. You know, that's, that's, if anything I've learned from my grandmother is the expression of love that everyone's your family, even her patients and 
the people she engaged with were her family. And we take care of them. You know, that's what we do. And that's what I've learned. Like, in all the years I worked with my apprenticeship with my grandmother, living with my grandmother, being in a family with my grandmother, it was always love and letting, letting us experience the consequences of our own choices. Mm. Beautiful. I can like, I don't know, you just brought me, I'm like, I smell the beans and rice. I'm like, I want to be there. <laughs> you know, there's a book that reminds me of her. There's a, it's a book called Bless Me Ultima. It's, it's, a, it's about a, a faith healer, a curandera in New Mexico. And mm. that reminds me of, too. And then there's a character in a, in a movie called uh, The Princess and the Frog. And she, uh, uh, Madam, uh, Mama Odie reminds mm-hmm. me of my grandmother, you know, the way she laughed and is this spicy enough? Do you think there's enough spice? That's so, <laughs> so great. That kind of thing. Love yeah. It. Well, I love the whole, you know, this petite little woman who could just, you know, be present and deliver a healing and was like totally with it. And I mean, to live to 98, what a blessing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Her father was 98 years old. Her grandfather was 116 years of age, wow. according to fam- family lore. I don't know about her uh, great great grandparents, but that's you know we come from that kind of stock. Yeah, knock on something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're doing you're doing good. That's so awesome. Um, I am. I'm curious in just reading about you in the bio, it talks about um, your father giving you this kind of mandate, said, find your way home, out, go home and master death. Wanted to ask you, what, I have a sense what that might be about, but what, what was that about? And what was that journey like for you? That most, most parents don't give that, you know, that charge to do sure. that. Well, it, it requires a little background on that one. Um, yeah. Being the eldest son of Don Miguel Ruiz, uh, I got to witness a lot of the stages of his personal evolution. I remember Dr. Miguel Ruiz and mm. the life he led and how he was, you know, he was a strict dis- disciplinarian and expected me to have straight A's. You know, that was, that's what he was. Then we had this aha moment. He began to pr- apprentice with my grandmother and engage and then they made, he made the decision to let go of being a medical doctor. The, my, my mom and my dad divorced at the, when I was eight years old. This is, all, this is all that happening, you know, that upheaval of life transitions. And that apprentice, Don Miguel Ruiz, uh, the way he parented was a combination of that strict side with a little bit of license fair, you know, like he was going back and to, forth between it. Then Don Miguel Ruiz, for example, when I was 14 years old, when I was going to school in Mexico, and I said, remember, I, I lived in San Diego and went to school in Mexico. Uh, education is, is mandatory up until middle school. The high school is kind of like college here. So if you want to go to college, you have to take entry exams to every high school you want to go to. Mm. So like, imagine going to high school and you can go. It doesn't matter where you it doesn't matter what zone you live in. You have to go and apply to all these high schools and see if you can qualify. And I only went for one because I was only interested in one high school, which was the International Baccalaureate that La Preparatoria Lázaro Cárdenas in Tijuana had. That's the only one I wanted. And my father says, well, up to this point, I am no longer taking you to get uh, enrolled. I'm not signing anything. I'm not writing a check for anything. You are going to be the one that looks for it. You know, if you want to get in, you go and find out when the test is, how much is that fee? Uh, if you've done enough work and your grades are up, I'll pay for that. Your, 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 your work is in, in grades. Now there's that little part right there. But I, it took me, it, 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 he gave my education and put it in my hands. It's I'm responsible. What kind of education do I want that I can easily be, you know, I could have easily, I could have easily backfired on him, but it didn't. I, it motivated me to do so. So that's the kind of Don Miguel Ruiz parent it was, you know, so with those kind of three stages of my father, you can see what kind of apprentice, uh, teacher he was. So when I became an apprentice, my father says, I'm not going to push you really. I'm going to teach you, but I'm not going to push you, which is to say, he'll give me the, 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 
the lessons, but not the practicum. You know, you, you can say it from that point of view. It's like, let's go first with the books. Let's first go with the concepts. Once you have the concepts, and basically, once you graduate from college, he says, once you graduate, graduate from college, I'll push you. But until then, you need your mind, and I'm not going to touch it. So I graduated from college. I, I studied film and video production in, from UCSD with a minor in theater. I, I graduated in the dean's list. I made the dean's list of, uh, you know, with my grades and all that kind of thing. And I graduated and my dad was true to his word. He began to push me a bit more and more. Mm -hmm. So that, that year after I graduated in 1999 from UCSD, my father intensified everything. Even though I moved to Berkeley, I left San Diego and moved to Berkeley, California, where I lived for a few years. He pushed, he pushed and pushed. So we went to Peru and in Teotihuacan, which is the following summer, he shifted my assemblage point where it was basically, he helped, he basically, I was blasted. I was just, I just had this aha experience that just, left me blank and just saw the beauty of what life is. It's just, mm -hmm. It was a beautiful thing. It, and then the game was, when this is when my dad said this, yeah. master death by becoming alive. Mm. And you come to realize, then you basically have, imagine you have this complete opening. Yeah. And then you think you're there the whole time and then you slowly engage the dream of the planet, which is society and community. And little by little, you think you're still up in that stage, but no, you're, you're slowly going in. It's, it's kind of like if you let go of, you went on a diet and you, and you stop eating carbs and sugars and salts for a good uh, 60 days, put it like that. And you got to a point where uh, when the end of it, you, you, you lost the weight, your, set, your taste buds re react and you kind of got used to not living with that, you know, th th those uh, carbs and sugars and salts as much as you would did before. And you feel good and you kind of feel like, I'm not going to taste that again. I'm never going to pick up that much salt. I'm never going to pick up that much sugar. I'm not going to get that carb. But then, you know, uh, someone gives you a little, uh, you know, you say, well, it's okay. I'll have a little toast. Yeah, it's okay. I'll have this, this little bit of chocolate. It's fine. And then if a week later and you're, you're already having the sandwiches, you're back to the, to the scone, you're engaging the, the banana bread and, you know, you, you, it's, it's, and, and you still think that you're clean, you know, you were at that level of clean, but you're not, you know, the, the body you've gotten used to. In fact, that you, you walk into the pantry and you're craving something sweet and you're walking in there going, I want this. And then all of a sudden it hits you like, wait a minute, I'm having this craving. And also you realize that, yeah, I thought I was back up there, but no, I'm here again. How that happened? Mm. Well, imagine in spirituality, you have that same experience. So you have that thing where all of a sudden, Little by little, all your wounds are exposed, all your beliefs are exposed, all your conditions are exposed, and all of a sudden everything hurts even more mm -hmm. to the point where you hit a bottom. You hit a bottom where you have to realize, I don't want this. And you, you have, you, you experience the biggest heartbreak you have in life, which is to me was, I'm not the guy I pretended to be. That guy does not exist. And that was heartbreaking. You know, it, it mm -hmm. came at the heels of a breakup that I had, you know, you, you had that one relationship where you can no longer project anything onto her because she hasn't done anything wrong. It was all my insecurity, all my stuff, all my conditioning beliefs, mm -hmm. all that belief about being a macho and all that kind of thing. It's like a freight train that finally crashed and all every single car went mm -hmm. and then And then that's when I realized that the biggest fear people have is not death, is living. Yeah. And yeah. it's the choices, you know, we, we fall into conditioning and domestication because it's so easy if you let your beliefs dictate what you say yes and no to. It's so easy for some, to someone else make choices and, and impact in that way to pretend to be something you're not for the sake of someone else's point of view, you know, the judgments, the, and all that kind of thing. It's almost easy because it means that you're not responsible for your yes and your no. Yeah. So you come to that point where you realize, no, my no is just as powerful as my yes. Mm -hmm. To take, to have personal freedom is to be able to say yes to the things I want to say yes to and no to the things I want to say no to. Yeah. And to learn, to truly respect myself is to experience the consequences of my own choices. Yeah. At that moment, 
kind of like Doctor, like the Uncle Ben told Peter Parker in Spider Man, with great power comes great responsibility. Well, my power is my will, my intent, mm -hmm. the expression that is me, the the force that animates this body, that animates this mind, and I will make choices that will lead to success. I will make choices that will lead to failure. And part of conditioning or domestication is to be afraid of both. Sometimes we're afraid of success more than we are afraid of failure. So we come to a point where you realize that it's all about to come, come forward a bit more. What are you going to do? Are you going to sabotage yourself because that's going to be the easy thing and your life won't be so tough? Or you're afraid of succeeding? Or are you more afraid of failure? At that point, either way, it cuts both ways and there you are. And then you realize that the reason you're in that cross, in the crosshairs of those two choices is because you truly believe those conditionings that someone says, in order to be someone in this world, you have to live up to that image. And that's when we realize that we're not afraid of death as much as we are afraid of living our own life, our own personal free will to live a life where I am happy being me. Mm. Because how dare you be happy with being you? Mm. you know, it's, it's, it's almost like you're being punished for that. So at that point, I had the aha moment. And I did the work. I, I, I did not date someone for a whole year. I apologized when I apologized. And then I realized that no one heals on my schedule, not even including me. And then the key to healing is to give myself permission to heal. No one heal, everyone heals with their own permission. Mm. And that's the big lesson I've learned in that sense. We heal with our own permission. You know, if, if, if you have PTSD, but you don't want to admit it because you don't want to look like a less of a man or a woman in front of someone else's eyes, then you're going to pretend that you don't have it because you don't want to look weak in someone else's eyes. Yeah. Well, whatever's keep saying to you, you're going to be weak. That's your domestication. That's your conditioning. That's the thing that's blocking you from healing. Yeah. And why do we want to heal? Because we want to live. Mm. And that's the, that was, for me, the, the, the teaching of that moment of my father. He basically hit that point and just sent me out to the world. He says, all right, figure it out. And it's basically about regaining my personal freedom or regaining my confidence in myself. Yeah. It almost feels too, it's like choosing to take responsibility, choosing life, like choosing it really powerfully. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's nobody else's fault but mine. It's like if, if yes, yeah. people, some people domesticated me, some people judge me and all that kind of thing, but like Eleanor Roosevelt said, yes, no one can make me feel inferior without my consent. And when, mm -hmm. when that hits you, when you realize that aha moment with that one, because I love saying that, that's my favorite quote. Yes. You realize that, yes, all those people said all those things about you, but the only reason why they impacted you is because you gave them permission to do so. And how did we give it permission to do so? We believed them. Mm -hmm. So the best way to let go of conditional love is to forgive ourselves for ever saying yes to it in the first place. Mm -hmm. It's really, really well said. That is so, uh, I'm <laughs> real time processing that. Like it's very, very powerful what you're saying. Really powerful. It's true. It's we, it's so true. And I think I do this too. And I'm constantly looking at what's going on and what, what is, what's mine and what can I shift? And it's like, it's really true. It's, it's, we gave them permission and we believed it. That is so powerful. Yeah, so all powerful. those judgments you ever heard, especially your own. Yeah. You believe yourself too. If you're yeah. standing in the mirror, like for example, what domestication is, is like you, we create an image of what is perfection. Perfection is something that's completely free of any flaw. That's what perfection is. Mm. Well, we'll grab that and we'll corrupt it. We'll distort it and say, if you want to be worthy of love, you'll be perfect. So mm -hmm. we create an image of ourselves that if we do live up to that image, we're worthy of love. And if we don't, we'll, we're, we're worthy of the punishment. Mm. So for example, I'll use myself as an example. Hello, my name is Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. I don't take things personal. I don't make assumptions. I always do my best. Ah, I forgot the fourth agreement. Oh no, how can I call myself Don Miguel Ruiz Jr.? And I'm not even saying it in order. Well, like, 
And there's a diatribe of judgment, punishing myself for not living up to that image of perfection. Yeah. It's kind of like saying to be the perfect version of myself is to be 27 years old, weigh 170 pounds, and have a full set of hair. But then I look at myself in the mirror, and that's just not the truth. I'm 44 years old. I weigh 182 pounds, and this is the truth of my hair. <laughs> because I didn't love that image. I look at myself in the mirror, and I start hearing that diet drive of judgment, which, means, which is, you fat. Yeah. You bald fat. You old bald fat. And there's that diet drive of punishing me for not being that image of perfection. Yeah. So that's what domestication is. If I live up to that image, mm. I'm worthy of acceptance, which feels like love. And the punishment feels like rejection, especially when I don't live up to it. Yeah. And that is the conditioning. So in this case with Don Miguel Ruiz Jr., the telltale sign that we use the four agreements as an instrument of domestication is judging ourselves for taking things personal, judging ourselves for making mm -hmm. assumptions, judging yeah. ourselves for all the rest. At that moment, we've turned the four agreements in the four conditions of our personal freedom. That's how we corrupt any tradition. We can corrupt Don Miguel Ruiz with the Tote tradition, Deepak Chopra, Marianne Williamson, Jesus, Buddha, Siddhartha, Muhammad, psychology, psychiatry, Alcoholics Anonymous. We can yeah. corrupt, corrupt all those beautiful traditions that teach us about unconditional love, but we're so attached to domestication that we will do that and we'll mm -hmm. give it to the people in our life. I can't give what I do not have. So imagine my wife standing here. She grew up in Salt Lake City, Utah. She grew up Mormon. Honey, you're Mrs. Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. now. Here's the four agreements. Read it. <laughs> Honey, you're, you didn't read the book. You're taking things personal. Oh, honey, you're making assumptions. I only hang out with people who are impeccable with their own word. At that moment, I'm domesticating her. You know, yeah. whenever we judge someone, we're punishing them for agreements they never made, but we're forcing them to make the agreement through the judgment. That's what domestication is. So if we look at that that way, that image by which we domesticate ourselves of what is a man, what is a woman, what is this identity that we have to live up to, in this case, in my case, Don Miguel Ruiz Jr., or anyone else's case for whatever, if you look at yourself in the mirror and you feel and hear that diet drive of judgment, those are the conditions that prevent you from being you. Yeah. Those are the conditions that stop you from healing because yeah. they won't give you permission to heal it because mm. a man is not supposed to cry. Yeah. Right. Wow. Well, I think what else comes to mind is that judgment, um, it, it just causes suffering. It causes mm -hmm. incredible suffering. I love, I love how, you, how you said that, though, about um, the, the four agreements. It, it, if, if you, this is the thing, and, and having, I have a background in the 12 steps, so I'll tell you with that mm -hmm. whole world, one of the things I, I remember um, is, is like, you know, then if you're not doing it the way it's supposed to, it's like, then you start that judging of yourself. It's like, mm -hmm. for me, one of the biggest healing aspects was, um, for me, I struggled with food addiction, like overeating and food and, and it would be to overeat and not judge myself was the miracle. It mm -hmm. actually, that became the miracle, not the, eventually it just fell in. Yeah. The face. It was yes. just amazing. I'm like, Oh, that's the piece is, is doing something that is, not pleasing to yourself and not judging and not judging. Yeah, exactly. It, uh, you, you hit it right in the nail. It's not necessarily about not giving in to the temptation. Temptation only exists in that moment before choice. Either you gave into it or you didn't. You yep. know, that's the thing about temptation. Once you make the choice, temptation dissipates. But the big thing and the big dry trap I've discovered is that once you give in, the judgment that comes all over it. Mm -hmm. And that's where you realize that, you know, you're doing it not because you want to, it's because you have to. Yeah. And that, you know, it, 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 I always say this image of Robert Downey Jr. telling Oprah, you know, when I wanted to let go of drugs and alcohol, it was the easiest thing. And she said, how can you say that? You were in and out of rehab all so many times. And he said, well, all those other times I went for other people. But when I wanted to do it for myself, it was the easiest thing. And there it is, you know, that's the moment of clarity. You're, we're doing it to heal ourselves. And we're mm -hmm. so attached to our domestication that we'll grab all these instruments that are meant to be healing us, you know, like going to 12 steps, going through spirituality, going through all therapy even. Uh, we used it and corrupt it because we're so used to that system of the motivator being conditional love. Yeah, yeah. If I live up to that image, I'm worthy of love. And I've, if I don't have it, 
how will I know that I'm not worthy of love? Yeah. And from that point of view, we will corrupt all those beautiful masters and all the beautiful teachers that I just mentioned, because mm. all, of their, all of their teachings are beautiful. Alcoholics Anonymous, Psychiatry, Psychology, Mohammed, Buddha, Siddhartha, uh, yeah. Jesus, Christ, Deepak Chopra, Marianne Williamson, Paulo Coelho, my father, and all the great teachers, Yogananda. Yes. It's, uh, it's all their teachings are beautiful, but if we get stuck and I have to live up to that image, I have to be more spiritual than the next, yeah. then we've corrupted it. In the same way we corrupted music, we corrupted mm. culture, we corrupted fashion, we cor corrupt being the color of our skin and we corrupt being a man or a woman. And there it is. There's the problem. Ooh, we need way more time than this. I mean, <laughs> like, <laughs> I'm like, I just, there's so much in what you're saying. And um, I mean, I, I, I would love to hear your thoughts about you because I know you wrote the book Mastery of Self and the Five Levels of Attachment. And just for mm -hmm. those that don't know it, maybe how what you teach there might relate to what we're talking about. Because I know, I mean, I know you have so many teachings and so much wisdom. Um, I, I will say, just to back to what you just said, the one thing that keeps like coming in, it just flashing in neon lights is mm -hmm. it's this and it's a practice i i oh god every day is really the the practice of unconditional love but with ourselves mm -hmm. and i'm curious if that's part of maybe you can say more about mastery of self because i don't know who does not want to have more of a mastery of self sure well for me the mastery of self uh, is the moment you no longer pretend to be something you are not you accept yourself mm -hmm. for who you are mm -hmm. conditional love only sees what it wants to see. Mm -hmm. That's the thing about conditional love. Unconditional love is the willingness to see life as is, which means mm -hmm. to be willing to see each other as is. You know, for example, take off the mask of father, take off the mask of mother, and I see the two human beings who are doing the very best with what they've got. Yeah. Because, you know, even we children domesticate our parents just as much as our parents domesticate us. Oh, we yeah judge them for do, not doing this. We judge them for, and we have expectations of what they're supposed to be. And we think having expectations of people is a good thing, but it's not. You know, we use expectations to chain people to pretend to be something they're not. But if you take off the mask and see them for who they are, then you will see your peer. You will understand. Most of us, when we, once we have kids of our own, all of a sudden we see them for who they are. We totally begin to understand them. And we have compassion. Yeah. And in that compassion, we realize that the secret we parents don't tell someone who doesn't have kids or especially our kids, we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> That's the secret. We're doing the best with what we've got. We're playing it by ear. Because yeah. as soon as we get used to being the parent of a one-year-old, they turn two, making everything we knew about parenting irrelevant. And then they turn four, they turn eight, they turn 10, they turn 20, they turn 30. And I realized that when I held my son for the very first time, yes, I read the book, What to Expect When You're Expecting. I took the class and I was pretty good at swaddling my son and I'm still pretty good at it. But yet when I held him in my, arm, in my arms for the very first time, I realized I had no idea what I'm doing. And also that's when I realized that my father had been, and my mother had been playing it by ear for all that time. And I went over to them and I apologized. I said, I thought you knew. And I said, nope, you didn't. <laughs> and, and that's the thing. That's something that happens when you take off the mask of mom and dad and you're willing to see them for who they are. And if you can do that with them, you can do it with other people in your life, your ex-boyfriend, your ex-girlfriend, your friend, your best friend, your beloved, your children, your mm -hmm. brother, your sister, everyone. And also you see them for who they are. And instead of trying to control their choices, you see them for who they are and you respect them. Yeah. But more importantly, you start doing it with yourself. Yeah. You can't give what you do not have. Mm. Take off the mask that you've been trying to put on yourself for all these years and use it to judge yourself and forsake yourself for. Yeah. And see yourself for who you are. Stop looking for yourself, searching for an identity with a definition to in order to know yourself through that identity and definition. But get to know yourself through the experience of being you and all the ups and all the downs and every, every direction. And then you get to know yourself through the experience. Yeah. And realize that you don't need an identity because an identity can barely encapsulate everything you are. Mm. From that point of view, unconditional love 
it's not that you're looking for unconditional love. It's not that you're looking for a definition of an acceptable point of view. You're willing to, to accept the whole of the yin and yang. You, you're willing to see both the wolf of love as well as the wolf of hate. And that they're both, mm -hmm. you know, like the charity story goes, I am both. And, on, and just unlike the grandson that asked the, uh, the grandfather, if I make them fight, which one will win? And the grandfather says, the one you feed. Yeah. You know, when you're still in conditional love, you'll say, well, I'll feed the, love, the wolf of love. And that's what the first time I thought about it when I first heard it. And then as I become, became aware of what unconditional love and conditional love is, mm. unconditional love is willing to see the whole of me. Yeah. I am both the wolf of love as much as I'm the wolf of hate. And I am going to feed both, but I'm not going to make them fight. The war ends mm. with me. That's, um, it's a, I have chills down my arms. <laughs> just to say, I, I, I love the way you just talked about unconditional love. Um, I don't think I've heard it said that way about seeing the wholeness. And I think this is where the conundrum, I think the riddle for many people is I want to experience unconditional love, except I don't love this part. And what I'm hearing you say, and, I, and, I, and I've experienced this to be true, is it's embracing the whole thing. Yeah, em, em, embrace the shadow self. Yeah, the shadow self, exactly. Embrace the shadow self as much as the other one. And at that point, mm -hmm. you have a choice. To make a choice be mm -hmm. between speaking from your authentic self, which is all of it, or expect, uh, expect speaking from that shadow self, yeah, or speaking from love. It's a choice. Yeah. Con unconditional love has always been a choice. Yeah. Just like respect and um compassion is also a choice and mm. that's what makes it alive that's the four agreements an agreement is the action of saying yes to something that's yeah. what an agreement is mm. good reminder thank you it's like i mean it's like of course but thank you for saying that it's, it's, yeah. it's a choice it's saying yeah yeah it's like yeah it's yeah. like the four con the, the, the four conditions versus the four agreements yeah the four conditions you think you have no choice you have to live up to that image yeah uh, enough agreement I can choose to take it personal and I can choose not to take it personal. Yeah. I'm free to say yes to either one. And in that awareness, I choose not to take it personal because I'm aware that taking it personal comes with a hangover I don't want to experience. Totally. And that's the choice. That's personal freedom. All four agreements have been extremely, when I started my self-exploration work about 18 years ago in through all different modalities, but certainly through 12 steps was one of the main ones. I remember I uh, came across, I think even before that, but I, of course it like fell off my bookshelf and I'm like, I better read that again. And I remember the not taking things personally, man, that is, that, that's been one, that and being impeccable with your word. Those two, I mean, all four are phenomenal. I just, wow. I mean, that it, it's so simple and so unbelievably powerful. And yeah. it is a choice and you know, it's funny you're right. Like the agree, it's the perfect word because it's mm -hmm. not the condition. It's your, you're choosing it. That's actually, yeah. yeah, it's a different, it's an empowered place to come from. Yeah. And, and you know, the funny thing is like, I used to have the same thing. It's like, there was like, people used to interview me before I even had a book, you know, and I, and they always ask me, which one of the four agreements is the most difficult, difficult one for you to practice. And I always say, taking things personal and being impeccable with the word. That's those were always the toughest too. Yeah. And then one day, I realized and it taught me the reason why those were the difficult ones to practice is because I was pretending to be a man who was impeccable with his word and they didn't take things personal. Uh, it starts yeah. with accepting the truth. Hello, my name is Miguel Angel Ruiz Jr. And I do take things personal. I do make assumptions. Sometimes I'm not impeccable with my word. Sometimes I'm not skeptical at all. I buy a hook, line and sinker. And sometimes I don't do my best just ask my wife. She is my witness. It is the moment where I stop pretending to be something I am not. Yes. And what I am not at that time was I wasn't a man who was impeccable with his word. And I wasn't a man who did not take things personal. I mm -hmm. definitely took things personal. Mm. And at that moment, that's what unconditional love is. I'm willing to see myself and accept my truth at this very moment instead yeah. of rejecting it or pretending yeah. to be or fake it till you make it. Yeah. You accept it. Yeah. And this truth, this is where I am. At that moment, I have a choice to continue to practice it 
or to begin to unlearn that and yeah. go in the opposite direction, which is to learn to, to be a man who doesn't want to, doesn't take things personal and is impeccable with word because that's my choice yeah. as opposed yeah. to a condition. Beautiful. Yeah, and I, I, I wish your grandmother was here. We could talk to her too, although I can, can feel her energy. And I'm thinking as the healer she was, what, what I've observed in my own self and body is that when we choose that empowerfully and really learn, like you said, to love yourself with the, I'm, I'm not always impeccable with my word. I take things personally. What I have felt, what I have found is that healing has happened in my own body when I've been able to love myself or even with those things that, that mm -hmm. acceptance. And of course I'd love to ask her about her thoughts on that, but I would assume uh, there, there's a correlation, you know, I think there's a correlation with healing and giving ourselves that grace and choosing powerfully in a different way. Yeah. Yeah. It's always a choice. It's always a choice. Such a, such a good reminder. You know, it's so funny how we go around thinking, and I hear this too, I hear with myself and I'm like, I'm acting like I have no choice. I, everything is. It's all free will. The whole yeah. thing. The, the only reason why it doesn't feel like we don't have a choice is because we're too uh, attached to an outcome. Yeah. And realizes that that's just one outcome out of many. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and some, some outcomes we don't want to experience, of course. So it feels like there's no choice, but it is a choice. You know, it's like, do I... Okay, let me put it this way. Let, let's imagine... Okay, I'll use my mom as an example. My, my, my grandmother had a stroke many years ago, so mm -hmm. I always imagine what it would be like to take care of my mother if she had a stroke. Conditional love does this. Mm. I'll have to be a good son, and I want to be seen as a good son, so I'm going to go and take care of my grandmother begrudgingly. I don't want to do it, but I have to because I have to live up to that image. And I go there resentful, upset, not wanting to do it, doing it half-heartedly. And the more I do it, the more I have resentment against my mom. And eventually it'll seep out and I'm going to start being mean to her. Yeah, That's conditional love. And mm -hmm. you're doing it not because you have love for her, but because you want the reward of being seen like a good son by the people around you. Right. It's my duty. And not the duty of of compassion of generosity but of sacrifice yeah generosity on the other hand unconditional love is well i think about it and i look at what my mom does i think about what would happen if i didn't do it mm. and I, I look at the consequences i see how it will play out and i says you know what no my mama's not going to experience that i'm going to go down there and help her and that's the difference i'm not begrudging i'm not resentful I'm only to see it as, as, as a sacrifice. It's my generosity I, I'm giving of myself to do it. If you can tell the difference between the two, you will know the difference between unconditional love and conditional love. And the difference is what's motivating you to make the choice. I have to, or I want to. With mm -hmm. I have to, you can already see the, the conditioning and, and the imposing, imposed will on that. I want to, you can feel passion behind it. You can feel, feel love, uncorrupted love. Mm. And conditional love is love. It's just that it's the only way you've ever learned how to love. But it's love. You just corrupted it. Yeah. Great point. Actually, I'd never, never thought of it like that. It's still, it's funny. I'm like, it's still in the spectrum of love. It's not the higher vibrational version or not the all encompassing what we're going for, but it's a good point. It's still, there's still yeah. an aspect of love in there. No, it's, it's like. <laughs> it's the motivator. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's the love that you think it lives outside of you. It's like yeah. the elusive carrot that you chase. Right. Whereas right. Traditional love is the source and uh, the source that fuels you. Yeah. The, the source that gives power to your actions as yeah. opposed to waiting and waiting for approval of someone outside of you. Yeah. For people who want more of you, uh, we got what, where, like, I know right now we're not doing events and things, but eventually we will. I'm like, I want to hang with you more. And I know people listening are going to be like, how do I get more of him and this and the very kind, retreats and you. events that you do? No, really. I'm like, how do we, how do we get, a, how do we get in your world more? 
because you've well, such we, we do have a website, uh, my father's website, which is miguelruiz.com and my, my own, which is miguelruizjr.com. And yes, we're on social media and all that. But for events and lectures, actually, that's more in person. You know, a, a workshop is more engaging than a two hour lecture, you know, yeah. or, a, a, or a book signing. But uh, I think the next one we're going to do, if everything goes as planned and there's no extension of things, as we already know, yeah. uh, will be at the end of June, we'll be in Sedona for the gathering of the shamans. Oh, wow. In Sedona. And I, then at the end of it, I'm going to be doing an intensive workshop on the Mastery of Self and a new book that I'm working on. Then after that, I, I know there's a few events that got straight up canceled and some events that just got postponed. So we will find out what stayed and what didn't stay. You know, we're flexible. That's the thing about life. At this point, yeah. you know, with everything that's happening, you let go of what you can't control. Yeah. But you look at what you can. And right now, my job is that I'm a father and a husband, which is always my job. But right now is to help uh maintain the mental health of my children and my wife and our dogs even you know because they go, go stir crazy as well and help them you know like know when to push with their distance learning yeah. when not to push how much space how much time and, and give them everyone space space needs is it's, it's a very good thing you know it, you don't have to force them to all be together yeah but you know that's the thing, you know, so I always, sometimes I say this is that, you know, when you're by yourself and you don't like being by yourself, then your relationship with yourself is, is there's a, there's some disharmony there. You know, the best a status of relationship, you know, using the Facebook analogy there is when you're by yourself, if you enjoy being with yourself, you're in a good place. If you don't enjoy being by yourself, then you're not. And that's the telltale sign that some, you need to work on something, so you want to work on some things. If you can tell the difference between what I just said, there it is again. I need to be, to be in contrast, so I have to, mm. and I want to. You know, there it is. The same thing applies with family, and you know, if you're in a, in a, in a with people, and then things come up, then there's things to heal. Like yes, we we're all experiencing uh, start with uh, no exit. You know, like the play, no exit, where yeah. Hell is other people. Well, the reason why hell is other people is because there are wounds that are creating that division. But little by little, if you are able to find that healing yeah. within yourself, you can begin to heal the relationship with other people. And mm -hmm. that's where we're at. You know, yes, there are, this virus has a 98% recovery rate, but a, and a one to two percent mortality rate. Yeah. From my point of view, the 98% is taking care of the two percent. Mm. Or one to two percent and we're doing this because we we take care of our elders and the vulnerable yeah but at the same time there's no that it's it's there's people out there who are going to lose their homes and they're mm. going through some financial hardships that you know sometimes it feels like social distancing is something that an upper class person will deal with but some people who are going middle of hunger it's it's, it's a huge huge sacrifice and we have to be considerate of them as well you know it's it's what's the balance what's this what's that that's what community does it's finding the balance of taking care of one another and mm -hmm. we're humans and in this time where we're all facing mortality and the, our fear with it or not it is that compassion for uh, for one another that's going to help us take care of one another to embrace each other to be there for one another to reach out and help one another you know it's 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 going to be a whole different world when, when this ends and we can choose to make it a harmonious one or we can let those things that tear us apart continue to do so and more so now if that mm -hmm. if we go that route but have compassion for both sides both the people who are losing their lives and the family who are dealing with that and the emotional grief as well as those families who are desperate to feed their children and don't want to lose their home yeah you know the both sides you know you see their humanity and that that is something important in life. I, I am so grateful. That was where we started. And I was going to just bring, you just brought us back to the whole thing about how, how we're going to help one another. And it was just so beautifully said, you know, it's really our choice. Yeah, it's, it's, our, it's our turn. It's our turn. What are we going to do? 
It's our turn, exactly. And it's really the, the same thing. We The golden thread is it's it's the choice. It's the question. What agreements are you making? So what agreements are you going to make now in, in, uh, in really considering community and that compassion and taking care of our elders? I love that. Beautiful. Thank you. Well, like I was saying, talking in the, in, the, in the interview, you can say that that is rooted in me taking care of my grandma and my grandma Sarita and my grandma Leonardo. You know, it's... Mm -hmm. it's, it's something being the oldest child of a family you know it's it's yeah. something that somehow you have and yeah. my brother calls me the bear and i can see why now <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome that's so great are there any last thoughts or words uh miguel you've had so much there's so much wisdom here and i'm gonna i'm just anyone who's if you're watching or listening i always have show notes as well but is there any last i don't know i always like to ask any like heart flair, anything that you're, that's like right there that you feel like you want to make sure to share. A moment of clarity without any action is just a thought that passes in the wind. Mm -hmm. But a moment of clarity followed by action becomes a pivotal moment in your life. It's a choice. What are you going to do? It's like the alcoholic that wakes up from, the, from a stupor and has a, a, awakening mo a, a awakening moment, an aha moment. They wake up and they see what they've done. In that moment, they have a choice. They can take the next drink and take the hair of the dog in order to get rid of that hangover. Or you change direction and you choose to go through the hangover, which is the beginning of detox. And if you go through it, you're going to heal your body. Mm. And that moment you choose to change your world altogether. And, it, and we can't heal what we do not know. So awareness is key to be yeah. honest with yourself. Yeah. Enjoy being you. Beautifully said. Thank you so much for today. What a gift. Oh, my honor. Thank you for the opportunity.